Everybody, so it's uh, uh, yeah, it's pretty hot. Uh, you know, I actually do appreciate the fact that any of you are in the room at all because this is day seven, the last slot. And when I saw that Edward had scheduled me here, I was like, "You're dead, dude." Yeah. But here we are. I'll try to make this quick, which is what I say to all my staff every meeting, and they, it's sort of become a standing joke at work. So I had to say here. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is just—it's uh, a very small point. Um, I went to a lot of trouble trying to illustrate it, but it boils down to about all of two sentences. Uh, but it was an insight that I came up with uh, just observing someone else's work. And I think there's some power in the idea, and so I want to share. Because uh, for most of what we do, uh, or the subject matter of most of this conference is uh, program design, innovations in functional programming, and in language design. Uh, we don't talk a whole lot about distributed systems in this community. Although talking in the hallway with people, it turns out that a lot of people are starting to enable way at problems that are larger than one process. We have, uh, we're a hosting company, which is, you can sort of say that's you know, kind of dull, right? It's just infrastructure and servers on it. But uh, it sort of creates all kinds of problems, which is to do it well, which means that we make money, which is good, but if we do it well, that means our customers get better service and more reliable infrastructure, and that's good all around. You know, that's, that's what we do. The trouble is, is that the state of the art for sysadmins is, kind of, the bar is kind of low. Um, People in, in the system administration world are still excited by these graphs. This is already a tool out of Toby, and it's been around for 15 plus years, and still people think this is an impressive way to monitor stuff, or at least to visualize things. The problem with this graph is that, I mean, you're not showing me a whole lot of information here. It's a scalar number, right? Eight servers in the cluster. And yet we have full graphs and, and you know, nice shading and everything else, but for, for a single data point, uh, or a single value, rather. And um, that's bad enough especially when you've got screens full of this sort of stuff all stacked up trying to identify decent information. But uh, it gets worse because if I shift the time scale from this is what, you know, three hours or so to a day, um, there's something wrong here. Um, our RD tool is, is a constant size database which was from the era when disks were expensive and you didn't want your logs explode your server so you would allocate a, a fixed size thing that had uh, the, the system has compaction built into it, so it would keep you know, reasonably high resolution for a day, and then it could average it down to a week, and so on. Lossy all the way down. And here it is, right? Um, I'm pretty sure there were not 7.8 servers in the cluster at any point. And yet, that's the information we have, right? So I kind of got it in my head that it would be a really good idea if we stopped with this nonsense and actually started keeping the data. Meanwhile, the analytics people, uh, really, statistics people really want all the, all the numbers. Uh, I would like to build predictive models on top of all of our systems metrics. In the short term, it would give us better alerting and prediction and, and, and monitoring. And in the long term, it will allow me to do capacity planning with uh, much better models than just back in the envelope. But to do that, I needed to be able to give them all the data. And so um, we've been off uh, running, building our own time series data store. Uh, this is uh, you know, the usual thing, and if this was a paper, I'd probably have a long uh, chapter about related work and all the other systems we didn't choose and why. I'm not gonna go into that today. Um, if you really wanna hear about that part, come to my talk at Rains Coffee here in January. Uh, Auckland, a fun city, I'm told. Never been there. Um, but um, we built this thing, and we got on this kick with the names of French mathematicians and stuff, so here it is, it's, it's, that's, that's the name of the code base. And uh, Voltaire is based on, on a couple ideas. One is that um, once a data point has been recorded, it's immutable. Um, we don't, we, it's, we're not updating. The other thing is that uh, actions on the system are idempotent, at least on the right side, uh, which is a really useful property because it means that most of the time in a distributed system, people are busy worrying about whether or not they've got the correct idea. But if you can just send the same data point in 14 times and have it, uh, the, the data store is append safe, so we just append, 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 then we do deep duplication and ordering on the read on the way out. And that sort of basic notion means that we can scale really well. The system um, looks like this. This is where we get to the, I don't know if it didn't come up right, I was worried the projector was not enough. Um, which is really just to say there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, you have clients that talk through brokers uh, to demons that ingest, this is version one, that ingestion demons that collect that stuff, write it down to our storage cluster, 
Uh, reader daemons that are all, every box is, is a server, basically. Reader daemons that, that uh, pull stuff out, make it available for interpolation and indexing for, for metadata. And then, in this case, I've illustrated one of the various consumers of this, which is a graphing front end. Because much as I want to build predictive models, our system may still need to just look at graphs. And so, uh, one of our people has built some, some pretty awesome, awesome ad hoc graphing stuff, just to be able to correlate things. Hey, look at this graph and that graph together quickly. And, hey, look, there might be something there. Um, the, I'll just put a, a brief note, because most of you probably have never heard of this thing called Ceph. It's a storage cluster technology, uh, along the same lines as, as Gluster and, and Watch. There's quite a few out there. But uh, Ceph's open source, and it is fabulous, because it's got scaling properties that where most other systems choke at 500 terabytes to a petabyte, it blows right through that and keeps on going 20, 30 petabytes, no problem. Um, that's sort of nice. It, what it meant to me is that I didn't have to worry about uh, a database running out of this space. Because we have all kinds of customers that have MySQL databases that they hit 100 or 200 gigabytes of data and suddenly crunch. Uh, not that you'd use MySQL or any RDMS for, for what I, the kind of data set we have here. But nevertheless, trying to expand data disks on a single machine is a pain, pain in the butt. So um, writing directly to the storage layer using its, its as it happens, C++ library uh, means that we can, basically, as long as I've got storage in the cluster, I can write to it. You know, I'm sure the office guys would prefer I didn't fill the entire thing with system metrics, but scaling horizontally is not a problem. So the whole system um, is a distributed, uh, a distributed infrastructure that has lots of moving parts that scales has nice scaling properties. Well, that was the theory. In practice, um, I made a bunch of design decisions that turned out to be awful. Um, proto buffs don't scale anywhere. That was the trans that the encoding we used a long way through. Um, I was using every single data point we sent through a, a map of metadata, which meant that I was building a persistent map every single time to work out to then serialize it, to hash it, to work out the address to where I was sending it. And I was generating, um, I believe the technical term is fuck tons of data. Except it wasn't data, it's throwing away. So it wasn't fuck tons of data, it was fuck tons of garbage. I had a 16 core machine that was maxed out, burning to the ground during the write cycle, about a minute to load stuff in, and about three minutes to write. I'm like, what's it doing? Is it, is it this, the library talking to the Ceph thing that's so horrible? No, 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 it turned out to be Parallel GC. Which was, I mean, good that Parallel GC will, you know, gets on with it, but three minutes of garbage collection maybe a wee bit too much. So, um, Christian is in the back of the room, uh, and, and I, or on a whiteboard, sketched out uh, a design that, that was much, much smarter. Basically, we boiled the whole thing down to a, a word. 64 for the address, and we're 64 for the timestamp, and we're 64 for the payload. Done. Fixed size formats. There's a there's a version for extended things. So if you've got web server logs or something that's like a you know, sort of a payload of bytes, we can we can handle that as well. And we talked about this on the whiteboard. And um, uh, the and, and the funny thing is that Christian then went and did it on a weekend. Um, but before I get to that, uh, I want to point out that this is a mess to test, right? Because the truth is, is that although I had unit tests in the middle, uh, you know, I mean, our, our writing and reading and the logic around encoding was all was all pretty solid, no problems there. And the client library was a, was a C thing, which is the usual auto tools nightmare. Uh, but they had you know a reasonable degree of, of of checking there. To pull the whole system together meant running up uh, a broker on my laptop and ingestion daemons and reader daemons and. Uh, I mean, unavoidably, a Ceph cluster in a VM on my laptop, and oh, by the way, then I needed to get some client load, and where am I going to get the, it? Just this, and this is, by the way, nothing unusual. I'm embarrassed by this, but nevertheless, this is a sort of common thing when you've got so many moving parts, you've got to bring them all up to do any kind of an integration test. You test individual pieces, but testing the whole thing really wasn't an integration test; it was a functional test on the outside. And you'd send something in, hope for the best, and hope something would come out somewhere on the other side and be correct. And we made mistakes. Uh, there was plenty of things that slipped through, and just doing really rigorous testing the way that the functional programming community has taught us is possible just wasn't happening. So uh, what, what uh, again, credit words do, what Christian did was he just started with a, a rewrite. Like I said, he did it on a weekend when I wasn't looking. And um, it started with this. Like, oh, I've got a writer and a reader. I'm just going to refactor it and redo the, the stuff that talks to, to Seth. And that was pretty good. But he was sort of annoyed that he had to run up this little 10-line C program via broker and have it run. And so the change was, and this is, this is the, as the, the core of this talk, was this, the, noticing this and then thinking about it, was he um, wanted to have, not have it be a separate, separate uh, VM, so he just rewrote the C broker, which was, this is all zero MQ at this point, and rewrote it in password. No big deal, right? 10, 15 lines. Um, but the result of this was, is that he now had one program rather than a whole bunch. And, uh, 
those were uh, three bits, you know, through those three modules there, and then the test harness in front, which has got main in it, or you know, running your H spec or whatever test suite we're using, and uh, there it is, one little program. So writing in, rewriting the broker in Haskell wasn't the thing that was that made the magic. What it was was this: the core application was rewritten as a library. So the actual code, this application code, is all it was basically just argument handling. And that's it. And then call into the library, and the whole thing comes up. And I went, wow. Because suddenly, you've got the ability to build one program which represents the entire application. And this, we can profile. This, you can uh, you know, run our standard Haskell profiling tools over and start to see where time is being lost and allocation is being set. <coughs> um, in this case, it's, it's interesting, you know, interesting to note that um, this particular iteration still had Ceph on the outside, so still needed to have a Ceph cluster to talk to, and it was still actually talking over the network zero and two between different pieces, which are externalities. But hey, um, it was something that you could build um, link against, and so uh, I ended up building something called Kitchen Sync, which had all the pieces together. He had unit tests that were integration tests that started to come together as more and more pieces glommed into this thing. Um, I, I, I'm going to flip back to the, the, the system as a whole because at this point, um, suddenly we had. Uh, it, back to the you know fully blown out one where there's lots of servers running. It's like oh look more Haskell, and it meanwhile what was going on is is we needed to write traffic into this thing, and it didn't take very long before we reimplemented a client library in Haskell, and so suddenly we had Haskell rather than having uh, a C library which everybody was binding to, we had a, a, they, the C, on the C side they had already written a daemon to deal with persisting points if there was, uh, if, if the network was unreachable and dealing back off and replay and all that sort of thing. So we just glommed onto that and rewrote that in Haskell. So the Marquis is the client library. Marquis daemon is, was now a thing. And there's a front end Haskell is just calling that directly, another thing calling a library. And there's a, there's a C library which uses it and there's a Python library now that uses it as well. Um, and this is going pretty well because more and more of the surface area of this application is in Haskell. Um, and it means that I can now build an integration test in the style I was just describing, where the entire thing does run in one program. Um, just a quick aside, uh, where did the title of this talk come from? The, the Twitter, somebody at Twitter named, uh, uh, named Erickson released a, a paper called Your Service <coughs> Function, where they talk about using futures to compose systems, which is only tangentially related to this, but it's an interesting read. Um, do have a look at it. They, they, seem to, they seem to be having trouble generating lots of garbage in a distributed system, the poor fellows. Uh, so here's the point that I wanted to get to. If I have my metrics vault available as a library, then not only can I test it in an integration sense, but uh, if it's a dependency of something else, then I can take my metrics vault and just link it into that something else. So we've got internal systems that also want to um, use, uh, use store information in, in, our, in our data vault. And uh, well, uh, the same program design is applied there, or this is just, we're just starting to set off in this direction. But if we build, as we rebuild our internal APIs in Haskell, Yahoo, um, we're going to follow the same pattern. And suddenly, the internal APIs are a library, which allows me to get to this, which is really the whole point. Suddenly, I've got the entire company as a okay, overlaid set in this union of libraries. And um, that's, pretty, that's pretty cool, because it means that I can build arbitrary integration tests which cross concerns. And if there's one thing that is really exciting about that is because it mean, I'm hoping and this is work in progress, but I'm hoping that this will mean that entire classes of problems and failure modes will go away. And isn't that the whole reason that we use Haskell and, and other strongly typed languages, is, is you know, to let the type system capture classes of errors and make certain problems go away? Well, up the level, yes, it's a distributed system, but um, for making sure that the data flows from end to end safely and securely, um, having to run that, that, that system is very hard to establish certainty and, quali and qualify, whereas here, as one application, we have pretty solid types end to end. Um, and uh, the last thing, and I don't, don't have an illustration for this, but uh, one of my staff asked me, well, wait a minute, what about people on the outside, uh, things that aren't written in Haskell? It's a fair question. Uh, by being able to run up the entire infrastructure that somebody building a control panel front end depends on, I can give them the company in a box. And so the web, the web guys in the front end doing uh, crazy CSS and HTML and JavaScript and trying to create a user experience around accessing, oh, they're only accessing the very outside edge of, of the internal APIs and, and building small front ends on top of that. And I'm encouraging that to happen in Haskell, of course. But um, the reality is, is that, or the current reality is, is that those systems are a disaster zone because 
there's all these disparate pieces and all these different languages that in most cases the people who wrote them don't even work for the company anymore and it's a nightmare to even, like some of the things we don't even know how they're built. This is the reality in any organization for around six, six months. Um, whereas I'm hoping and aspiring that this approach will allow me to bring more and more systems into this closure where I can test it. I can, the fact of being able to, anytime somebody's going to build an integration test or a functional test that uses it, we'll exercise the entire build chain and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that this will uh, dramatically reduce the bit lot and, and uh, you know, by forcing us to keep things up to date. Um, as a final thought is, uh, this is a slide I showed you a minute ago, which was where we're at. Um, but uh, just uh, while I've been away this last week, I've discovered uh, two new projects show up on our GitHub pages, and that's that the uh, web servers um, grow in a, a Haskell fork, and so has the search index. So um, that's pretty exciting. And that's all I've got. Any questions? Five, four, three. You're out of here. Oh, oh yeah. In, uh, in the first slide, you were yep. showing a lot of different servers with a lot of different uh, languages, exactly. Yep. And uh, in the last one, basically, you had two servers, I guess. Uh, you What's mean about this one here? No, no, no. I mean, the last one with the uh, Haskell everywhere. Oh, exactly. Okay. You know, so, so, so every single one of those uh, squares, I think they're squares. Never mind. Uh, every single one of those boxes is a separate server. Um, for example, um, should be two underneath the broker. Um, it, it represents H either HA pairs, or in the case of, uh, for example, the, the writers pulling work, um, there's any number, that's, it's a nice pattern, there's any number of workers <coughs> that when they're able, they pull their reach to the, out to the broker and say, hey, I'm ready for another piece of work. Uh, it scales nicely as opposed to the usual load balancer pattern, which is pushing work down to uh, worker nodes that may or may not actually um, have ability to get work done because they might be flat out, um, and um, it's just sort of the state of the art in web server business still. And then you spend a lot of time while well, we have to monitor the, the, the worker nodes to see if they're too busy to find out which one to send the work to, which is kind of silly if you can just invert that and have the workers pull work as they're able to. And, and if you discover that work throughput is dropping unacceptably, well, you fire up more workers, mm -hmm. assuming your system has the property of the on scale. Just wanted to uh, to mention that uh, Marius Erickson is actually the uh, the co-chair. <laughs> uh, no, unfortunately, he was he was uh, he had something come up at the last minute, so that's ah. why I've been running around doing everything kind <laughs> of myself. Cool. No, it's good. It's good um, paper. It's enjoy. It's an enjoyable read. Um, I like what they've done about. I mean, they're using features to and uh, composing systems uh, by making a request that returns a promise. Uh, that that's, that action will happen. So it's a, it's a nice model. We haven't, I haven't had a chance to explore it myself yet, but um, sounds good. Well, thank you very much. Sure. All right, guys. Well, that's uh, what we're